Hello and welcome to The Sidebar, presented by True Crime Daily, taking you inside the courtrooms of high-profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. I'm a criminal defense lawyer based in Los Angeles and previously an L.A. County prosecutor for nearly a decade. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ or at JoshuaRitter.com. We are recording this on Friday, July 14th, 2023. In this week's episode, prosecutors seek the death penalty for a plastic surgeon charged with the murder of a lawyer all over a billing dispute, and the body has never been recovered. Also, the competency hearing of a woman charged with the brutal murder, sexual assault, and dismemberment of her alleged lover. But first, after over 50 years of incarceration, a Manson family member convicted in the infamous LaBianca murders walks free. Today, we are joined by Katie Tchaikovsky, a former federal prosecutor and current criminal defense and civil rights attorney. Katie is also a legal analyst you can catch on Fox News, CNN, News Nation, and many other national media outlets. Katie, welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. We we were looking forward to this. Um, And before we jump in, just so uh, listeners are a little more familiar with you, could you tell us a little bit about your background and current practice? Absolutely. So I started my legal career in the U.S. Air Force as a JAG and a prosecutor for the Department of Defense. And I was also a former federal prosecutor, as you mentioned. And now I, along with my husband, we run a criminal defense practice. We focus primarily on federal criminal defense and all all sex defense primarily. That's that's our big thing. But really, any criminal cases whatsoever, we've handled them over the years, either as prosecutors or as defense attorneys. So the criminal laws where, where I've ended up for for the entirety of my career, for the most part. Very cool. I love the JAG background because did you you have to do both sides, right? Did you you get assigned cases where you're prosecuting and other cases where you're defending? Well, kind of. Yeah. So it, okay. there are both jobs. Um, I was only a prosecutor. My husband was a prosecutor, then a defense attorney. You you only do one at a time. You don't switch back and forth, you know, in the same job per se, but there's opportunities right. to do both those things. But it's, it's, a, it's a great trial job. I know that you uh, have extensive background um, and that you also follow these cases very closely. So we're very uh, curious and excited to hear your thoughts on these things. So let's jump in. The first case is out of Corona, California, where after being denied parole over 20 times, former Manson family member Leslie van de Houten was released from prison on Tuesday, July 11th, 2023. Governor Gavin Newsom announced that he will not challenge an appellate court decision to release van Houten despite having reversed her parole grant on three previous occasions. Van Houten was convicted in 1971 for her role in the Manson murders, specifically her participation in the attacks on Lino and Rosemary LaBianca in the Los Feliz neighborhood of Los Angeles. Speaking about her role in the murders in an interview, Van Houten admitted to stabbing Rosemary LaBianca in the lower back 16 times as the victim was lying on the floor. Van Houten and other cult members convicted of murder were initially sentenced to death, but soon after, California Supreme Court ruled capital punishment was unconstitutional, thereby commuting Van Houten's sentence to life. The death penalty has since been reinstituted in California, but is currently under a moratorium instituted by executive order of Governor Newsom. Van Houten, who was 19 at the time of the murders, has served 53 years behind bars, gaining both a bachelor's degree and master's degree while in prison. Following her release, Van Houten will participate in a transitional program to attempt to acclimate her back into society. Um, Katie, just jump right in. Were you surprised by this, by her her release now these many years later? I was surprised, but when we're talking about the parole system, it has to have some meaning behind it. So if you're eligible for parole and you meet the criteria at some point, the law would require that you should be given that opportunity. But I mean, she really lucked out here. She was serving a death sentence. Now she's out at 53 years. I mean, that's incredible in and of itself. So, um, you know, I think that from a defense perspective, it, this is the the way that the system is set up. And I think interestingly, the, in the in the case, there was other opportunities she had to to be granted parole. And the board had found that really because of the nature of the crime being so egregious that she wasn't granted it at some point and a higher court actually said that because they were not giving her a fair opportunity and were saying, you know, 
point blank because the crime was so bad, she could never essentially receive parole that they were instituting an unlawful sentence. So they had to be fair about this. And the criteria in terms of being able to go back into society and be rehabilitated to at least some extent, if you meet those, then you should be eligible for that fairly enough. You know, I've gone back and forth on this so much, but I, I completely agree with you. And it sounds like with the with the court in this case that if if you're going to sentence someone to life with the possibility of parole, then that has to be an actual possibility. Then you have to actually right. entertain their request for parole. Otherwise, it, it, this is all a farce and you've really sentenced them to life without parole and we're just going through the motions and it's all a, a big... Um, you know, big, big play that they're putting on. Well, right. I um, think that's interesting. I, and yeah, I think in terms of the nature of the crime, if you're only focused on that, then you can always get back to the answer of it's horrible. It's horrific. And, you know, seems like a very dangerous person, but that can't be the only analysis, I guess is what they were saying. Yeah, no. And I, and I agree with that. But this case bothers me in particular because she was originally sentenced to death. Yes. And just because the the machinations of the criminal justice system here in California, they commuted that when they uh, abolished the death penalty in the 70s, didn't commute it to life without parole, commuted it instead to life, which does give her a possibility at parole, which is how we end up here today. When they reinstituted the death penalty, they didn't go back and then reinstitute those sentences against people who had originally been sentenced prior to their change from the Supreme Court. So there's all the getting into the weeds on how we end up where we're at today. My point being though, one of my big things is to respect the verdict of the jury. Well, a jury looking at the facts, having lived through the trial, found her not only guilty, but found it was appropriate to institute the death penalty. Now that that's not me arguing that she should somehow be put to death, but it is it is a little troublesome to me that that same person who was at one point by one jury sentenced to death is now, gonna, is now as of today, walking free. What are your thoughts on that? That's a very good point. It's incredible. I mean, and I, I think that it does send a message about the justice system in terms of the finality of those verdicts. Um, she she really got the benefit of all these changes of the law. That's for sure. I think we have to remember, though, you know, even though they did send it to her to death at the original time of the crime, it was closer in time. She was 19 at the time. She was obviously a member of a cult. There was a lot of drug use involved. Now, these are mitigating factors. They're not exculpatory factors. But I think that um, in terms of the kind of mitigation of it there is a lot there to that extent but you're right i mean i i can't believe how lucky she is she must she must be the luckiest inmate that i've heard because that's yeah. that's incredible but yeah. yeah it's it's interesting how the law when there are changes made sometimes that does or does not impact prior cases and i think you made a good point about you know when they reinstituted the death penalty how do they justify not reinstituting the the sentence that was imposed? I mean, it's it's hard to get a death verdict like that. So, you know, no. I would I would have thought that too. But I mean, under the way things stand, it makes sense, if you will. But it's there's a lot of questions about the overall justice of it. I think, especially for the family, I'm sure. Yeah, and to your point, you're absolutely right. She was 19. She was brainwashed by this cult. Uh, you know, she wasn't the only person who participated in this. There, all of these, like you pointed out, mitigating factors. But my point is, those were mitigating factors that were all presented at her trial when yep. she was convicted and and sentenced to death. So she had her, her opportunity for those to be heard. Absolutely. So a, a, an analysis of those now is essentially, in my view, and I'm not like some huge death penalty proponent, but in my view, it's... It, it was allowed to essentially usurp, to essentially reconsider somebody's sentence um, that was decided upon by a jury. And I, you know, it, I'm not saying I'm. I, I feel that somehow she should remain in prison. I'm not even. I'm not even really getting into that argument. I'm just more talking about the idea of. I think it's a slippery yeah. slope when we begin to reanalyze verdicts because those should mean something. 
Yeah, I agree with you. Um, it's actually interesting in the military system when the um, verdict is rendered, the appellate courts have like a unique ability to relook at the case and determine on their own if there was proof beyond a reasonable doubt and they can overturn a jury verdict just based on their own independent analysis of it. So I wow. see this sort of, and, and people of course complain about that um, because it does seem so counter to the notions of of our constitution even maybe but it's been upheld and i think there's just these different iterations of how these justice systems work but yeah it, it really is incredible that you could have a death sentence and then now be out on parole granted i think when they imposed the death sentence obviously there hadn't been as much time for rehabilitation in there and it's been decades upon decades at this point and so that's an, a, another consideration that the parole board has that the court didn't have at the time but i mean that's the whole point is when you get information later in time you can't go back and disturb every jury verdict i mean people would love to do that oh you know now this person has a change of heart they wouldn't have testified against me like that well too little too late right so yeah. you know that kind of thing i mean unless it was like a significantly huge piece of information but for the most part it's like these things are final literally yeah. so and that's a that's a very interesting case and especially such a high profile inmate yeah. of all people yeah and that and again to just kind of dovetail off of your argument that yes she she showed it she's is a case study in in rehabilitation. I mean, she got her bachelor's degree and her master's degree, and all reports is that she was kind of a model inmate in her her later years. I imagine there are a lot of people on death row who would love to make a very similar argument that I've been sitting here languishing on death row for for the past few decades, and look at all the good I've done. And again, I I think that's. At least a conversation that really needs to be um, fleshed out as far as should that matter about overturning a verdict, which is almost what took place here. But again, I don't I want to essentially don't, true. Yeah, and I don't you know, want to keep on. Go ahead. I think that in the terms of the rehabilitation, when you're in prison, you're really I mean, how much trouble can you really get into now granted you can but it's it's very limited and then of yeah. course you know getting a degree because you're sitting around and you might as well do something i mean that's great and i totally encourage that but at the same time is that such a display to overturn a verdict or a sentence as you mentioned i mean that's a bit a bit more interesting i mean i think yeah. that's why i would like to hear from her because it would be nice if she actually made a public statement like hey you know I really truly am reformed now. I'm whatever whatever we might want to hear as the public. But I mean, what else did she do? Because there's other things that people get involved with behind bars in terms of, you know, efforts and sort of beyond just like typical studying and not getting yeah. in trouble. But I yeah. guess they were compelled. Well, my last question on all of this is what, what do you think the impact this will have on other cases and even the country moving forward? Because one, Patricia Krenwinkel and Tex Watson also convicted and received the death penalty initially involving involved in the uh, Manson murders. They're still incarcerated. I imagine they're looking at her and saying, hey, what about us? You know, I've, I've done some rehab as well. And also California just kind of seems to act as a incubator or whatever you want to call it for policies, both political and legal throughout the country. And I'm wondering what, what are your thoughts on the death penalty in general? And do, do we see kind of maybe a sea change taking place in the country? Well, I think as a practical matter, the death penalty has been a huge disaster for across the country because of all of the litigation that goes into it and how long it takes to. And I mean, there's just it's just not a clean decision that's made. And it's never I mean, there's so many appeals for you know decades following the imposition of a death sentence that it doesn't make practical sense in, in, to a lot of people. Um, but for the to the extent that it does address the most egregious offenses and um, and, you know, to, to kind of address it for the family's sake, the, the victims in those crimes, I think that it is meaningful and significant. But I think as a practical matter, it's uh, a lot more difficult. So, you know, in this case, I think we have to remember that this wasn't just like an automatic decision to just let her out. She had been before the parole board, I think over 20 times over the years. Yeah. And I don't do a lot of parole work myself, but you know, there are specific things that these boards are looking at and they will or won't be compelled in a particular case. So, you know, the nature of the crime and 
other people that were involved in the same thing is one thing, but it's really the totality of the package that they're looking at. So, you know, everybody has their individual case analyzed. And I guess if you're going to go with this case, you know, if, they, if you meet the standards and the board votes in your favor, then you are granted parole if that's something that your sentence makes you eligible for. So I, I don't know that it changes much in terms of how parole boards work, but I think like you mentioned earlier, the way that this all played out in, in the, the laws in California that allowed for a sentence of death to now be a life sentence with the possibility of parole, is a, that's a big difference. And then, you know, when you're before a parole board, okay, I guess if you qualify, you qualify. So yeah. I think that's, no, there's no message to be sent other than why did this person end up out of prison in 53 years, which is a long time, but it's certainly not death or life. Yeah. Um, that's a big difference. Yeah. No, it's, it, it's, it's, there's no easy answers to any of this. It's a lot of questions more than anything, but I, I, I mean, end of the day, I don't blame her or her attorneys at all. I mean, they, they're doing the best by their clients. And if she was uh, a, a prisoner who was eligible for parole, then she should have been given the same opportunities, and I and I agree with the court's thinking on this case. It's just how we ended up there that gives me a little bit of pause. Speaking of the death penalty, let's now move to St. Petersburg, Florida, where Florida pro prosecutors are seeking the death penalty for a plastic surgeon charged with murdering a lawyer who has been missing since March of this year. The attorney, Steve Cozy, represented a medical practice that was being sued by Dr. Thomas Kozowski. Kozowski alleged the practice had shorted him thousands of dollars in medical billing and even harmed his reputation as a doctor. According to authorities, sometime after a conference call both men attended in March of 2023, Kozy was never seen again. Police believe that Dr. Kozowski took the conference call, get this, from a Toyota pickup parked outside of Kozy's office. Kozowski is alleged to have then entered Cozy's office and murdered him in the bathroom before dumping his body in a remote area of the Everglades. Authorities searched the landfill fill where the body was believed to be located. However, the facility regularly compacted trash, which would make finding the lawyer's corpse nearly impossible. According to court documents, evidence against the surgeon includes blood and DNA evidence from Cozy found in the law practice and Kozowski's garage. Additional DNA was located in a pickup allegedly used to transport the body, which authorities say Kozowski purchased in cash before Cozy's disappearance. Authorities have also stated that cell phone data collected from Kozowski's phone is consistent with their theory of Cozy's murder and that the concealment of the body. Following a nearly six-hour bail hearing on Tuesday, July 11th, a judge denied bond for Kozowski, leaving the doctor in custody awaiting trial. All right, Katie, in most cases um, involving the death penalty, we've been talking about that today, and we talked about how, um, you know, jurors have a lot of mitigating and aggravating circumstances to consider in arriving at that very heavy decision. And that's why usually these cases are reserved for murders that are particularly heinous and murders where the evidence is remarkably strong is, is just kind of where we anecdotally seem to find it. So my question to you is, are you surprised by prosecutors moving to seek the death penalty in this case, despite the lack of a body? Well, it's interesting for sure. I mean, this is a textbook circumstantial case. I can't believe what they have on him. So the ex to the extent that they don't have a body, um, I guess that the prosecution's theory is that that was that probably is one of the aggravating factors, the the concealment of the body, the manner in which he disposed of it in a trash compactor, that that explains the the absence of the body and in fact should be used to um, show how much more heinous this crime was. So I, I'm sure that's the thought process behind it. And I mean, it's compelling. There's a lot there. They got they got the whole story lined up. So um, it's interesting. And in, I think you know, we're talking about this, this is in Florida, right? So yes. the death penalty recently was changed to not even require a unanimous verdict in Florida, which is very interesting in and of itself. Um, and I think that, you know, there's, there's political points that are being made about, you know, how they're going to respond to criminal activity. And in this case, 
it is very heinous. There's premeditation evidence. I mean, there's just a lot of a lot of um, factors that probably played in favor of that recommendation. But the lack of the body is going to be a problem. It's always a problem in any murder case, I think. But I think they have a good explanation here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think the putting aside the, the fact that they haven't located the body, the circumstances are such that I understand it fitting into a case where they might seek capital punishment. I mean, you have a murder um, based upon some sort of financial gain or revenge. You have lying and wait. It was obviously premeditated. All the, all the kind of hallmark things that you look for in a case that might be considered for capital punishment. My point yeah, is sorry. more is more along the ideas of as the defense, you can see, I could absolutely see them making the argument of how in the world you may you may feel that he's involved in his death, but there is always the chance that we don't know if this person's actually in fact dead because we have not located them. And to put somebody to death for that, it's just asking too much of you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. I don't know. That might not be a, a, a an argument that holds much water, but it's just you don't seem to find these types of capital cases in in cases where there is significant, and it, it might be that they're able to surmount those, but it, you know, I would call a no-body case a significantly difficult case for the yeah. prosecution. No, that's true. Uh, I think it would depend on the extent of the the forensic evidence of the blood and, and how much we're talking about. Um, if there's a chance that it's not consistent necessarily that somebody absolutely died. Like, I, I mean, I know that they're going to have differing expert opinions on that, I'm sure. But I think I don't, I don't know enough about all their physical evidence that they have. Yeah, no, we'll find out. We're very early on. So maybe I'll end up eating my words here to some extent, but it was just an interesting thing that stood out to me. The other thing yeah. I wanted to talk about is is you brought this up. Florida has recently changed their laws regarding the death penalty, and they did yeah. that uh, in response to, uh, for the most part, the Parkland massacre where um, that shooter was not ultimately um, uh, sentenced to the death penalty uh, because the jury in his penalty phase was not able to reach a unanimous decision. And that bothered a lot of people, um, myself included, actually. I mean, I, I believe that if we're going to have the death penalty, it should be reserved for incredibly heinous acts. And this is one of them. Yeah. Um, and many were frustrated by the idea that one or two jurors took that away from people who wanted ultimate justice in that case. Um, you know, putting politics and everything aside, They've now changed the law in Florida so that it's no longer a unanimous decision. And I always have a problem with legislation that seems to be a knee-jerk reaction to something that you don't like. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that change. Do you think it's a good change? Do you think it's problematic? What are your thoughts? Well, I, my understanding was that there was bipartisan support behind it, um, probably because it was so emotional in terms of the, the Parkland case. So, you know, I don't know that it's constitutional necessarily, um, really, but I am surprised that that's all they were going to require. And I'm not entirely sure of the the procedures, but my understanding is that the, the, that a judge might also have to take a look at the case and make an independent decision on the sentence. But yeah, I mean, it's significant to not require a unanimous verdict for a capital um, punishment. Very significant. And yes, I think you're right that sometimes in looking at things myopically, you want to make a rule that applies to a certain situation and you don't really think about how that will be used against you in the future. <laughs> Classic. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, I, I, you, we see this all the time where there's a lot of public outrage and it, and part of my problem to it is it's not public outrage to usually a very systematic problem that needs to be created, but it's usually one case. One case will offend people so much that they yeah. want to change in the law. And I think this is a example of that where this case bothered people so much that they demanded from the legislators to do something about it. And it's also in the wake of an incredibly emotional response. We're not talking about a change in the law some five years down the line where everybody's um, emotions may have 
uh, calm down. But, you know, in the wake of all of that, I just think it doesn't make for good law. But I'll, I'll leave it at that. Finally, we turn to Green Bay, Wisconsin, where a Wisconsin judge is considering a psychologist's testimony surrounding the competency of a Green Bay woman accused of a man's brutal murder and dismemberment. Taylor Shabiznis has been charged with homicide, along with mutilating a corpse and third-degree sexual assault for the murder and dismemberment of her friend Shad Therion. Shabiznis has undergone multiple competency hearings, with the judge ruling in 2022 that she was fit to stand trial. However, a psychologist testified recently that he did not believe that Shabiznis is competent to stand trial noting that the 25-year-old's lack of insight and judgment would render her unable to assist in her own defense. Notably, and along those lines, Shapiznis recently even attacked her own attorney in court, and we have some footage of that that we can show you now. Stop it. Stop it. Pretty incredible stuff. This psych testimony comes shortly before Shabiznis is scheduled to stand trial on July 24th. While no ruling has been made on her competency, another evaluation has been scheduled and the judge will hear has testimony on that next Friday, July 21st, before jury selection is set to begin in the case. So they're putting these hearings um, really up close against the 11th hour of trial here. So first of all, um, Katie, talk to us about um, the standard for competency. When we're, when we're talking about competency, it's different than what we're talking about insanity that's used um, as a defense. It's a, it's a much lower standard, no? Right. So when we're talking about competency to stand trial, that's different than saying that you're not guilty by reason of insanity because at the time of the commission of the offenses. Um, so the analysis has to be done that whether you can actually participate in your own defense, whether you have an understanding of the proceedings and the nature of the proceedings. Um, and, you know, to the extent that somebody claims that they're not fit to stand trial, for the most part, they're going to be held in a state mental institution pending their return to sanity and fitness to stand trial. They're not just allowed to you know, continue on with their life. So it's not a get out of jail free card, literally or figuratively for that matter, but it is a matter of being able to constitutionally defend yourself um, under the, the law. And yes, you're right. It doesn't have to be to the highest, to the standard that you don't appreciate the wrongfulness of anything, but just really that you're able to participate meaningfully in the proceedings and, and in, in your defense. Right. And in fact, we have seen in many cases where somebody is pursuing a not guilty by reason of insanity defense and has been declared competent to stand trial. So it, it, it's not like the argument can be made that well, if I'm so insane, I shouldn't be able to stand trial or vice versa. It's a really different question. And like you pointed out, it's a very low standard. Essentially, it's just, are you able to understand what's taking place? And if you are so uh, suffering from some sort, of, sort of mental impairment that you don't even understand who the judge is, who your attorney is, what you're being charged with, then we're not going to put somebody, and rightfully so, through all right. of that. Um, but you but you kind of um, got to a, a point I wanted to also ask you about here. If she is deemed incompetent, that doesn't mean that she's she's done. And we saw this famously uh, and most recently in the Lori Vallow case where she was a, the mother accused of killing and now convicted of killing two of her um, children. She was declared incompetent, went to a mental institute. Competency was regained, went back a couple of times, and that is what kind of delayed her trial. Um, so I guess talk to us about that. Right, exactly. So <laughs> under the law, at least, maybe in reality as well, you, people can be either insane legally um, for portions of their life. So maybe during the commission of a, an offense, you might claim that you're not guilty by reason of insanity. And that may actually be true, but that does not mean that you you continue to be insane, legally speaking, um, necessarily. It has to be determined at the time of trial whether you're still in that state or not. And then, as you mentioned with Lori Vallow, there are people that are declared to be unfit to stand trial at a certain point. They could be suffering from an acute um, you know, mental disorder that's, that does remedy itself um, or alleviate to some degree to allow them to be able to meet the standard to participate in the proceedings later. So it's not a forever diagnosis, if you will, and it has to be determined 
mind under the circumstances um, at the time that you're looking at. So if we're talking about can you stand trial, the question, as you said, is are you able to, to understand what's going on here and participate? You don't have to be a lawyer or like at the same level of, as that, but you have to generally understand what's happening and what you're being accused of and how this whole thing is going to go. Um, so that can change over time. And you have experts that get involved and do analyses of these people that are accused, the patients, um, and then they give their testimony and the judge has to make decisions about that. And of course, there's going to be arguments on both sides about it, but ultimately the call is made on one side or the other. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's not a one-way door. You you can float in and out of it and at yeah. different points in your life and been declared at one point incompetent and perhaps even make the argument that you were insane at the time of the the uh, commission of the crime and fully be competent enough to stand trial. So exactly. thank you for explaining that to us. Last question on this. Um, the judge is hearing all of this, but he's not moving the trial date as of yet. And that trial date is quickly approaching and we're still having these hearings. Do you, am I reading too much into this or do you think that's kind of signaling something um, a little bit about maybe where the judge is leaning on this issue of competency? I think that the defense is going to argue that that it was predetermined if they don't get their way. Um, I think also, though, on the other hand, you, sometimes you just want to schedule things and have the jury ready to go in case you can move ahead. But, but you know, if the judge determines that she's not, fit to stand trial, they have to hold the trial in abeyance until she's found fit. So I don't know if it's been predetermined or if they're just trying to logistically set things up so that, you know, if they're able to roll into the, into the case, then they can do so without a huge hassle. It might just be, it might just be that, but you know, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I think, I mean, it hopefully is fair what happens is that, you know, if there's legitimate evidence, she's not able to stand trial at that time or participate in the defense, then it should be delayed. And if it's, it's not really a problem anymore, and maybe even they think she's exaggerating or something like that, you know, then got to go. But these things will be litigated and they'll continue to be litigated even after the trial, especially if she loses and um, they proceeded at that point. So the defense will hang on to that for a while. Yeah. And, and one thing I know, a big motivating for, factor for judges is they don't want to be reversed on appeal. So I don't think a judge is going to push this issue to the point yeah. where they feel like they're giving the defense some sort of appealable issue. But right. we Not will continue. <laughs> right, right. We will continue to watch that case and update everyone. But in the meantime, that is our show. Katie, thank you so much for coming on this week. Where can people find out more about you? Thanks for having me. Um, you can find me on my website at goldenlawinc.com. And I am really not active on Twitter too much, but I'm on Twitter at Cherkasky KD. Fantastic. And I'm your host, Josh Ritter. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ or at joshuaritter.com. You can find our sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address, Tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCD Sidebar. And thank you for joining us at the True Crime Daily Sidebar. Sidebar.